Hey guys, in this video I'm going to show you guys my top 10 favorite GameCube games. And uh, for a couple years now I've been trying to do a uh, GameCube collection video, but I have about like 90 GameCube games right now. So I decided I'm just going to show my 10 favorite and then at the end I might show like a lightning round of uh, other like honorable mentions or something like that. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I wanted to do it for a couple reasons. Uh, one is to sort of celebrate the GameCube, which I feel like is an underrated console. I kind of got its butt kicked, um, you know, by the PS2 and to some degree the Xbox. I was kind of even with the Xbox, but especially the PS2. And um, I actually feel like uh, if you go back and look at all three consoles today, um, the GameCube might be my favorite in terms of games I'd still want to play today. I mean, the PS2 had like 10 times as many games as the GameCube, but... It has a lot of games that, like, don't really age well. They're kind of meant to be played, you know, during the moment. Like, why would you want to play Tekken 4 when, you know, Tekken Tag 2 is out right now? Or, like, why would you want to play, you know, Grand Theft Auto 3 when you can play 5, you know? Games are sort of, you know, they have their moment in the sun and then it's kind of over. So, I have about as many PS2 games and I might do a similar video for that one day. But, yeah, I want to focus on the GameCube right now. And uh, so I'll be talking about my 10 favorite GameCube games sort of in depth. I kind of did this for the N64 like a few years ago. So if you like that video, I think you're going to like this one a lot. Um, the second reason is that I sort of want to like showcase some of the best games for, you know, someone who might maybe they hadn't really paid attention to the GameCube back when it was still a relevant console. And, um, you know, so maybe they're trying to start the collection right now. So I'm going to showcase the 10 best games on the system you know that have aged gracefully and they'd want to play now so if a better version of that game was released later i'm not going to mention it so and also if the game was multi-platform and was better on something like xbox or ps2 i'm not going to mention that either so uh, those are the two rules i kind of that i'm going to abide by for this video so uh yeah let's get started all right, so for number 10, we've got F-Zero GX, which uh, Nintendo actually let Sega create, um, specifically their Amusement Vision team. They developed it, and uh, Nintendo did it quite a bit back then. Um, they, they have a lot of franchises, and they don't have enough employees, so they, uh, they often let other um, publishers work on their games, like uh, Capcom, uh, they, they made a few Zelda games, and um, Namco made a Star Fox game on the GameCube. Uh, so yeah, uh, Sega made this one. And uh, I would say this is the best racing game on GameCube, which sort of tips my hand and uh, sort of indicates that Mario Kart Double Dash will not be in this top 10, and uh, I might go into why later. We'll see. But uh, yeah, I, I definitely think this is the best racing game on GameCube. Um, you know, one of the first things you'll notice when you play this game is that it's extremely fast and smooth. Uh, I believe it runs at 60 frames per second. Uh, just super smooth. And it's actually like a technical like masterpiece in the GameCube like you're sort of wondering you know how these guys made this game work on the GameCube uh you know it's just very there are 30 uh, races on on the track too so it's all that much more impressive another thing you'll notice right away is that the game is extremely difficult um very unintento like uh actually in that uh it gets very hard very fast so it takes a lot of time to master and it takes a lot of skill which is sort of why a lot of people love this game. It's actually kind of a cult phenomenon, especially lately. Part of that is because there hasn't been an F-Zero game in quite a long time. And uh, to be honest, I don't think there will be one. Uh, just because this series hasn't sold that well, at least lately. Um, but uh, but yeah, uh, definitely recommend uh, F-Zero GX. Um, I guess there's not too much else to say about it, other than uh, uh, definitely a challenging game. And... Um, uh, yeah, definitely one you want to check out, F Zero GX. So now for number nine, we have Mario Power Tennis, and um, this is sort of a follow up to Mario Tennis on the N sixty four. And um, there's also a Game Boy Color game, but that was more of an RPG, which is actually kind of cool. And I wish it was on the consoles, actually, the RPG element. But um, so yeah, so to sort of differentiate. Uh, this game from the N64 game, they added the sort of gimmicky, like, power, you know, system, where each character has, like, a power move, an offensive and defensive one. 
and they each do different things and they sort of, you know, add individuality to each character. And uh, so that was kind of cool. It's sort of a controversial addition to the series just because um, it takes away from sort of the purity of tennis. But, you know, when I'm playing a Mario sports game, I'm not like looking for like a sim or anything like that. So the wackiness, the better for me, you know, for this kind of thing. So definitely appreciated the power shots. And um, I still say this is the best Mario Tennis game. I, I know there's one on the 3DS, but... Um, uh, I just haven't heard great things about it. I haven't played it myself just because I'm not too interested in trying it out. Uh, it felt kind of bare bones to me when I was looking at the features on it. And um, so, yeah, I definitely think this is the best game, or Mario Tennis game, rather. And obviously, the reason why you want to play this is uh, for the multiplayer. I mean, the single player mode sort of gets old quickly just because there isn't that much to do in it. I mean, there are like a few cups that you can complete, but then after that, it's like. You know, what are you doing? So yeah, you definitely want to get a, a friend or two over and play that way. And uh, it makes it that much better. And uh, one additional thing I'll say about this game is that uh, you'll notice it has a bestseller sort of, you know, thing on the label. Which is funny because they had it on the first shipment. You know, I got this right around the time the game came out. So apparently they already considered it a bestseller despite the fact that it just came out. So... I guess they were sort of, you know, cocky in a way and sort of like, I don't know, predicted it. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. They did it with uh, Mar or Paper Mario as well, which is a weird thing. I don't know. I just wanted to point that out. Point that out, rather. Sorry. I can't talk today. So, uh, yeah, let's move on to the next game, number eight. So we've got Mario Golf Toadstool Tour, which is kind of the brother game of Mario Power Tennis. And the sibling, rather. And uh, I sort of echo the same thing I said about Mario Power Tennis. Uh, this is sort of a follow-up to the N64 Mario Golf game. Uh, it's a little more gimmicky in that the courses, they have like war pipes and, you know, piranhas and stuff like that that you have to sort of utilize and avoid. And um, I will say the single-player mode is actually more fun in this game just because it's fun to get a birdie on each course. Uh, and... Uh, so yeah, definitely better than tennis in that regard. Still a fun multiplayer game, but I actually do like the single player game quite a bit. Yeah, so basically this plays a lot like Hot Shots Golf, but it's better because A, it has Mario characters, so they're more interesting. And it just feels a little bit better to me, a little bit more polished. So I'd say this is the best golf game out there, period. So highly recommend it, and I feel it's better than any of the other Mario Golf games. Though the 3DS one is coming out soon, and... That actually does look promising. It has an online mode and the courses look great. So maybe this game will be irrelevant in a few months, but we'll uh, see. For now, I recommend this one over the other golf games. All right, so for number seven, we've got Pikmin, which came right around the launch period. It came a month afterwards in December. The system launched in November. Came, uh, I believe it came out the same day as Smash Brothers Melee, too which I might be talking about later. Who knows? But, uh, so yeah, some people say this was Miyamoto's last great franchise. Uh, Miyamoto being the creator of the Mario, Donkey Kong, and Zelda franchises, and he's also worked on a ton of other stuff in the background at Nintendo. Um, so, uh, yeah, they, they claim this is his last great franchise. I wouldn't go that far. Um, but it definitely is a really unique series, and, um, it's it's one of those games where, you know, Nintendo's sort of known for approaching um, sort of established genres in their own unique way. Like for a fighting game, they made Smash Brothers, which is unlike any other fighting game. And for this, it's sort of Nintendo's take on the RTS genre, real-time strategy. And for my money, it's pretty much the only good um, RTS franchise on console. It was pretty much just made for a controller. And unlike other RTS games on console, which feels like they're based on the PC version, meaning they're more limited on console. So I definitely say Pikmin is the best in the genre for on console. Um, so basically, um, you're a uh, astronaut who crash landed on this alien planet inhabited by Pikmin and other creatures. Pikmin being on the front cover, these little like plant creatures. And uh, throughout the game, you're sort of building up an army of Pikmin. Uh, 
In this game, they're only yellow, blue, and red Pikmin. They each have different abilities, and um, basically your goal is to, you know, find parts scattered throughout the, you know, each environment, and um, have your Pikmin sort of, you know, carry all the items so you can rebuild your ship. <laughs> they're kind of like slaves, but um, if you think about it, but uh, I try not to think too hard about this stuff. Um, but, but yeah, that's a really interesting mechanic, and... Um, you know, I I do like this game more than Pikmin 2, which is also in the GameCube. Just because it's, like, surprisingly hard for a Nintendo game in that... Or harsh, rather. In that you only have a 30-day limit to complete the game. And, uh, you know, after the 30 days are up, it's kind of game over. Which is, like, sort of cruel and, un, like I said, un nintendo like And in Pikmin 2, they sort of give you unlimited time. And it has, like, a lot of randomized dungeons, which I didn't like. So yeah, that's that's why I prefer the first Pikmin, and uh, I actually do like it more than Pikmin Three. So, you know, definitely a great game to play and um, very unique. All right, then we're getting right along this list. Things are going smoothly. So for number, let's see, six. I'm already forgetting. That's not a good sign. Yeah. So number six, we have Super Mario Sunshine. And uh, this is definitely one of the weirdest Mario games out there. It's sort of the black sheep of the franchise, I'd say. Or at least one of the black sheep. There's a lot to say about Super Mario Sunshine. I mean, it's very un-Mario-like in a lot of ways. Like, it has voice acting in the opening cutscene and, like, throughout the game, which, you know, this was back in the day when... The gaming industry, people thought the industry was only going in one direction, which is to say, like, a more cinematic and realistic, you know, manner. Meaning that every game needed, you know, voice acting. And this is sort of a casualty of that era. And as a result, the, char the characters have just awful, you know, voice acting. And it's not like the Mario games today where they'll say, like, one or two, really, you know, quips. Like, there's, like, a full full-on like dialogue going on in the opening cutscene and it's just bizarre you know i mean nowadays we know that you know video games are sort of you know there's a lot of variety to video games and you know not all games need to you know aspire to be the same thing so you know and, and we also realized that a lot of nintendo games probably shouldn't be talking a lot so yeah the, nintendo definitely learned from this game i think the other weird thing is that it has the sort of water pack, the flood they call it in the game, which is very, very un Mario like. Sort of the genesis of the the flood is that someone at Nintendo was sort of, you know, toying with the idea of a water gun, not related to Mario, and Miyamoto saw it and said, "Oh, that's kind of interesting. I guess we'll implement that in our latest Mario game," which is sort of how Nintendo works. Actually, they have a lot of different people working on different concepts. And then they'll sort of figure out, you know, which concept should be used in their already established franchises. So that's kind of a unique and interesting way of developing games. Um, they can afford to do that stuff. Uh, a lot of other companies can't. So that's why the games tend to have more polish and stuff like that. They have more time to work on these things. But um, so, yeah, there's, like I said, there's a lot of to say about Mario Sunshine. There's a lot of good and bad things about this game, like... Look, the good thing is that the water gun feels really good. It's fun to travel with the flood and, you know, shoot enemies with the flood. And the water graphics look great. And still some of the best water animations to this day, actually. And uh, there are sort of these levels that, um, where you didn't have your flood, which are really like these sort of hardcore, like really platforming, platforming levels, which uh, I guess Nintendo sort of, took and then made Mario Galaxy based on that pretty much that those sorts of levels which is you know Mario Galaxy is one of my favorite games period so that ended up working out well but uh some of the bad things are like I said the voice acting and uh they had this annoying blue coin system like where there there are blue coins scattered throughout all the levels and the whole the overworld and it just it felt lazy to me, like they just added added them to like pad out the game and you know, add to your game clock so you wouldn't sell the game back or whatever. It just felt cheap to me. And uh also 
Um, <laughs> the, the camera was really bad in a lot of inst instances. It's been a year or two since I played this game, but I don't think they used the C-Stick for camera control, so it was sort of like really... It, it just didn't work out well. And the camera, they sort of fixed in future Mario games like Galaxy, where the camera's good most of the time. So if they remake this game, I think if they take out the blue coins and fix the camera, I think it would be a much better game in general. Um, let's see. What else is there to say about this game? Oh, yeah. One thing, random thing I liked is that um, when you when you ride on Yoshi, the music changes. And they add, like, the sort of drums in the background, kind of like they did in Super Mario World. It's one of those small touches where I just, I love, that's what I love about Mario games, you know, the small touches. And I love that to this day, Nintendo, you know, continues to add these touches to their games. So definitely love that. I know it's a really small thing to say, but, uh, you know. But, uh, yeah, that's Mario Sunshine. It's definitely the most unique of the 3D Mario games. And, you know, it's sort of the last really ambitious Mario game, you know, in terms of 3D. You know, games like Super Mario 3D World, on, on, or ironically, do not have, like, really expansive worlds. Whereas in this game, they're really big. Like in Super Mario 64, so... And that that's another reason why you want to play this game. They're just these really big and interesting worlds. So yeah, that's Mario Sunshine. Alright, so getting into the top five, we have Soul Calibur 2. And uh, this is the first multi-platform game on my list. And uh, you might be wondering why I included it. And uh, the answer might actually be on the box art. Uh, Link is in the game. And uh, each version had a different exclusive character. Um, the PS2 version had Hihachi from Tekken. And uh, the Xbox version curiously had Spawn in it. Uh, I can't really explain that, but... But, uh, yeah, uh, Soul Calibur 2. Uh, I'd say it's actually the best uh, 3D fighting game out there, like, even today. Uh, there are five Soul Calibur games. Uh, three of them came after this, and uh, they actually haven't been as good as this game. Um, so to talk about Soul Calibur 2, I just feel like it's really fast and smooth, and it's... Pretty much everything you want from a 3D fighting game. I, I like all the emphasis on weapons. And there are actually a ton of unlockable weapons in this game. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, I you know I just I really like that Link is in the game. Uh, he's really fun to play, and uh, he's really well integrated into the universe. Like he feels like he belongs in there, unlike Kaihachi and Spawn. Uh, the the story is that um, Link was exclusive to the game, and then. You know, Sony and Microsoft found out, they're like, well, why don't we have exclusive characters? So they sort of, like, shoehorned Hihachi and Spawn in later. At least that's what I've heard. And that makes sense because, you know, like I said, Link is, he feels like he belongs in this game. And, uh, one, another thing I really like about Soul Calibur 2 is it actually has a single player mode that's worth playing. Uh, the Weapons Master mode. And, uh, the reason why I say that is because... You know, with an old fighting game like this, you're not going to find that many people who still play it. So, multiplayer isn't as much as an option as it was when it came out. So, that's why I still recommend playing it today. Like I said, it just feels great. And, um, I haven't played the Xbox version, which I actually hear is in 720p. But, this definitely feels a little bit better than the PS2 version, just in terms of, like, how it runs the game. So, that's why I included it on the list. I just feel like it's the best version of the three. And like I said, the best 3D fighting game, so I yeah, definitely highly recommend it. Alright, number four, we have Metroid Prime. Uh, there's a lot to say about this game. It was made by Retro Studios. It's their first game, or was their first game, rather. Uh, they canceled a lot of games before this, and um, there's a huge story, you know, development history behind this game. Uh, you know, Metroid kind of skipped the N64 generation because they couldn't really think of how to, you know, move her into 3D like they did with Zelda and Mario. It took a little bit longer for them to, you know, sort of figure it out. And, uh, it was originally supposed to be a third-person game, but apparently Miyamoto, um, decided it should be first-person. And, you know, you don't really think of him as a Metroid guy, but, you know, he works on a lot of different Nintendo franchises, not just like Mario and Zelda. Uh, I actually think he's underrated, surprisingly. I know a lot of people would say he's overrated, but... Anyway. Um, 
about Metro Prime itself, you know, uh, it's sort of like the perfect blend of uh, Western and Japanese uh, game development. You know, we all know that, you know, Japanese developers have problems, you know, with first-person games, but, you know, I feel like Retro sort of helped in that regard, and it also has the, you know, the Japanese polish and, you know, emphasis on, you know, great character design and world design and uh, game mechanics and stuff like that. So it was a great blend. Um, you know, I th I still think it's one of the best looking games of all time, like technical specs aside. If they put this game just in 1080p without touching anything, I think it would still look better than pretty much any game out there. Uh, so uh, that's just how strong the art design is in this game. But um, so yeah, just talking about the transition from turning Super or Metroid into, from like the side scrolling game into you know first person game. That is actually like you know when you think about that sort of transition, you just realize how brilliant the game design was, and, you know, you know, how well thought out everything is, like, how the Morph Ball was in third person to make it easier to sort of see, it would be sort of, uh, you know, disorienting if, you know, the Morph Ball was in first person, and, you know, it had all the different elements from Super Metroid, you know, like the different beams, the grapple hook, and stuff like that. And it had, still had the sense of exploration in the Super Metroid. A little bit more linear, but uh, it actually had a ton of exploration. Which you can't say about most first-person games. Which is why people consider this more of a first-person adventure than a first-person shooter. And um, it has a lot of small touches like a lot of Nintendo games do. Like you could see Samus' face on the reflection of your visor. So it gives a bit more humanity to the character. Which is really awesome. And uh, just... The first level, I have to say, is really incredible. Like, I replay that over and over. Even if I don't have time to, you know, replay the whole game, I can just play the first level and just really enjoy that one. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's Metroid Prime. Still a great game. Um, it's better than 2, which is also on the GameCube. It just felt... 2 didn't feel as, you know... It didn't feel necessary to me. I sort of had, like, this Dark World, Light World mechanic that you know, Zelda games sometimes have, uh, it just, it didn't feel right to me, and 3 on the Wii, uh, it was good, but not great, so, I feel like this is still Retro Studios' uh, best game, which is sad, because it's also their first game, but I know how much talent has come and gone from Retro Studios over the years, so, it sort of makes sense why the games are sort of varied in quality, so, uh, yeah, that's Metroid Prime, uh, let's move on to number 3, which is The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. And uh, this might have actually been a little higher um, last year or in before that, but, uh, you know, Nintendo recently released uh, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD, which I also reviewed, so check that video out if you want a more in-depth review of this game. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to, you know, sort of repeat that review video, but I'll just go over some really short uh, tidbits. Um... You know, it's known for its unique art style. It has, like, this cel-shaded, uh, cartoony style to it, which was controversial at the time, but people have sort of warmed up to it, um, you know, as the years went by. Um, it has an emphasis on sailing, which, again, was controversial at the time. Um, they sort of made it, they made it a lot better in, uh, the Wii U version because they made the sailing faster, which is sort of, you know, is better for re when you replay the game. Uh, when you're playing the game for the first time, you don't really mind the, you know, the slow sailing because it feels more like an adventure. But when you're replaying it, you don't want to sort of tread the same ground like that and, you know, wait a long time to get from place to place. And uh, so the reason why I still have this on the list, despite, you know, the Wii, ver Wii U version being better in my opinion, um, I would say that there's still a reason to play this game. Um, one is that the the art style is a little bit different. Um, this one, like I said, is a bit more cartoony, um, cell shaded. And while the Wii U version has this more three D look, um, I'm not gonna say which one is better, but they're both different. So I can see why someone would want to play this version over that one. Uh, the second version um, is sort of an underrated uh, reason. Uh, the controller. Uh, so the GameCube version, I haven't really talked about that in this video, but. I feel like it's a really great controller, um, for the most part. 
it has a couple of problems like um the lack of a, a fourth shoulder button you know it has r l and z but no like no fourth button um another's the c stick which isn't that great and then um some people say the d pad is really small i thought it was okay like it looks really small and it looks worse than it really is but it's functional but other than that um i I think it's the most comfortable controller to actually hold in your hand. Um, I don't know what it is about it, but it just feels great. Both the uh, wireless wafer controller and the original. Um, also, I love the um, the layout of the four sh or the four face buttons, the A, B, X, and Y buttons. Uh, they're really unique, and the A button is this really big button. Um, I don't know. It just it just feels really great, and. Um, I feel like Zelda games control best with the N64 or GameCube controller. Even the Wii versions were pretty good for the most part, but on the Wii U gamepad, it didn't feel that great to me. It's kind of like how for the N64, like certain games, they don't feel that good on other platforms. Like I can't play Star Fox 64 on another system or another controller or Mario 64. They just feel right on the N64. So I feel kind of the same way with Wind Waker. I just I like the control scheme better on the GameCube version. So, yep, that's why I like this version a lot. Still, still ranking number three. Uh, I guess I'll just talk about the game a little bit because I haven't really done that. Um, like I said, I I talked about it a ton on my video review of the uh, HD version. But um, if I were to rank this among the 3D Zelda games, I'd rank it. Um, behind Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, but ahead of Twilight Princess, which is also in the GameCube, and uh, Skyward Sword. Uh, while I think there's a lot of charm, uh, I think the dungeon designs aren't as good as they could have been. Um, I also feel like the overworld could have had a bit more to it. I really like the sailing element, but otherwise it just felt kind of empty, so... Yeah, that's Wind Waker HD, or not HD, but it, uh, that's the Wind Waker, and uh, still a great game. <coughs> Alright, so top two. For number two, we have Metal Gear Solid, the Twin Snakes. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that this is a really crappy box, because uh, of the ten games, this is the only one I bought used. I bought the, re the other nine uh, new back when they came out. Um, so I guess I need to switch out the box with something else, because this is really nasty. But, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, this is basically a reimagining of the original Metal Gear Solid on PlayStation. It was developed by Silicon Knights, who also made Eternal Darkness on the GameCube, and they also made, like, Two Human on the Xbox 360. And, um, so, uh... It's basically, it has a remapped control scheme. It sort of feels like Metal Gear Solid 2, uh, control-wise. And uh, the most controversial element um, of the game is that they sort of redid all the cutscenes. Uh, they're more stylized. They they have, like, the sort of Matrix-y feel, um, which is very different from the original PlayStation game's feel, which is a bit more realistic. It's hard to say realistic when there's, like, a psychic dude who can read your mind. But... In terms of the Metal Gear Solid series, the first one is like more realistic than the rest of them. But uh, I actually really like, you know, the stylistic choices in this version, because you know while people may say that, you know, it's less realistic. Well, Metal Gear Solid two, three, and four aren't realistic either. So this actually makes sense in context to the rest of the series. It just fits better, you know, when you play all those games. So. That's why I prefer this game, and they also made it a little bit easier. I feel like Metal Gear Solid 1 on PlayStation is surprisingly surprisingly difficult. Like, you usually wouldn't associate difficulty with Metal Gear Solid 1, but if you go back and play it, as like old school difficulty. Uh, you know, when you're starting out the game, you have a very low health bar, and it's just not... There's something about it that just feels weird to me, going back to it and playing it today. Whereas this game, it feels a bit more smooth... Um, it has some Nintendo, uh, un unique Nintendo features, like it has a Yoshi doll, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, I just, I just feel like this is a very great version of the game. And Metal Gear Solid 1 on PlayStation is, you know, in itself a great game, so. Um, yeah, this might be a controversial pick for number two, but, uh, definitely love the game, and, um, still a game I play today. All right, and the best GameCube game, Super Smash Brothers Melee. I was so hyped for this game. This is 
you know, this is probably one of two games that I've been super hyped for, and the game actually exceeded my expectations, you know, Mario Galaxy being the other one. And, you know, months before this game came out, I literally printed out, you know, pictures from IGN and, like, had them on my door in my room or whatever. I was so pumped for this game because I love the original game. And this game, you know, it's sort of hard to realize it now because, you know, we've had Brawl and stuff like that. But when this game came out, it was such a huge leap over Super Smash Bros. on the N64. It introduced so many new characters. You know, there are only eight characters in Super Smash Bros. 64. There are, I think, 25 in this game. I don't remember the exact amount. There are a ton of new stages. It was so fast and so smooth compared to the N64 version. You know, it added new mechanics like the air dodging. It had new modes like the all-star mode and the adventure mode. And just, it just had so, there was so much to it. And it just, it came out in 2001. And yet I was still playing it in like 2008. And I've even played it as recently as, you know, three months ago. So, and that proves how much lasting power this game has. And, um... So, there are two camps usually, one that's melee and one that's brawl. Um, why can't we have both? That's my question. I actually really like both games. Um, I think brawl has better stages, and I like the roster more, because it has more characters, obviously. And I, you know, I play that one more these days. But melee, it's a little bit faster. And while it has less modes, I feel like the modes are better in this game. Like, all of them are really good. And, like, stuff like Break the Targets are really great in this game, whereas in Brawl, they're kind of an afterthought and kind of lazy. So that's why, even though Brawl came out, I feel like Melee is still a very playable game today. Which I actually can't say about the N64 version. Um, I know a lot of people still like playing it today. But this is one of the few Nintendo games where the sequel came out, and I literally never wanted to play the old one again. It's just, when you go back to it today, it's so much slower. It's more of a juggle fest. You know, you're sort of juggling characters because you can't air dodge. You know, the throws are too overpowered. And, you know, the sound effects are kind of questionable, though. It's a little bit better than the Japanese version. Um, but, yeah. Uh, so, that's Super Smash Bros. Melee. That is the best game on the GameCube. I don't think many people would disagree um, it's still played competitively today, it was at the latest Evo, um, so, yeah, um, that just shows the longevity of the game, and, uh, still must have to this day, and I doubt they'll ever re-release this game, so, uh, yeah, pick it up. Alright guys, so here are the top 10 GameCube games stacked up, uh, here's how they're gonna look on your shelf, um, GameCube games look incredible, so I feel like you guys are really gonna love... Uh, you know, collecting these things, if that's what you're trying to do here. Alright, so for a bonus segment, we're going to do a lightning round, where I'm going to talk about 10 honorable mentions, or games that are worth talking about on the GameCube. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about each one, but I wanted to, you know, talk about some more GameCube games. So here's The Legend of Zelda uh, Twilight Princess. Uh, it still has a sticker on it. Uh, I haven't gotten around to removing the label yet. There's this solution that collectors should all own. Uh, it's called Gugon. Uh, it takes away these stupid, you know, GameStop stickers fairly easily. Uh, I just haven't gotten around to it. But anyway, so yeah, Zelda Twilight Princess also came out on the Wii. This was originally a GameCube game. Um, it was announced at uh, E3 2004. That reaction video is incredible to this day. It's, you know, it gives me goosebumps still. But, um, so go and check that out. I'm talking about the game itself. Um, uh, I think it had too much padding in it. It had a lot of great dungeons, but it took too long to get to them. Um, it had, it had some stupid, like, fetch questy stuff. We had to collect, like, teardrop and stuff like that. Uh, it definitely had a lot of cool elements, though. Um, in terms of this versus the, versus the Wii version, uh, I actually might prefer this version over that one, just because it has full camera control, even though it's not in full widescreen. But, um, so yeah, I, I prefer this version over, uh, the Wii version. Uh, so next up we have the launch game, Luigi's Mansion. I got this with my GameCube. I actually got it a few days before the GameCube came out. Um, because I remember sometimes games come out before the console comes out. So I got this about four days before. I can't believe I still remember that. But, say so this was a launch game. It was pretty controversial just because it was the first Nintendo home console in America that 
didn't launch with a Mario game. And I know these days people um, are skeptical that Super Mario Brothers launched with the NES, but um, for the most part it did, because by the time most people heard of the NES, Mario was already out, so I consider it a launch game anyway. Um, but yeah, that aside, uh, so people gave it lower scores because they were kind of mad at the game, sort of at, from the beginning, but uh, it's actually a very playable game. Um, I prefer this over the 3DS Luigi's Mansion, just because the 3DS version, uh, I didn't like how it was segmented into different levels, and you got like a score at the end, which was really gamey to me, whereas in this game, it was one mansion, you knew why you were in the mansion, it was to save Mario, and it sort of told a story that, it actually had a story in it, you know, whereas the 3DS one is kind of dumb, <laughs> like you're sort of wondering why you're playing in the first place. And if you don't know what the game is, I probably should explain that earlier, but it's sort of where you're sort of, you know, sucking ghosts into a vacuum cleaner, kind of like Ghostbusters or something. Um, it's a quote-unquote horror game, but it's not scary at all. Maybe for, like, five-year-olds it would be scary, but still a very good game to this day. Next up, we have Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Like I said, that's the best-seller label on it, which is odd. Uh, this is a follow-up to the N64 Paper Mario game, and... Uh, it's sort of the last true uh, Paper Mario RPG game. Uh, the the other two that have come out on uh, the Wii and uh, 3DS haven't really been RPGs in the same way. So the Paper Mario series is known for like the really witty dialogue, and uh, it has a great localization. Uh, unfortunately, they did censor the the uh, American version and um, most of the European version. I think it wasn't censored in Italy, but basically there was this transgendered character that uh, they sort of took out of the game because apparently Nintendo doesn't want to acknowledge that certain people exist. So that sucks, but other than that, uh, very good game. Next up, we have Pac-Man Versus. I mean, you'll notice that there's also Pac-Man World 2, but uh, we're, let's not talk about that game. Let's talk about Pac-Man Versus, which um, was actually designed by Shigeru Miyamoto, I believe so. At least he had some part in it. So this utilized a feature I haven't really talked about, the um, connectivity feature, where you could link up your Game Boy Advance with um, a GameCube. And so basically how it worked is that one player would... So four people could play, and one player would be holding the Game Boy Advance. They could see the entire Pac-Man maze. And the other three players, they control the ghosts. Um, and they can only see a small portion of the screen. And they're chasing uh, Pac-Man, who the... Game Boy Advance um, user is controlling, so a very fun game. Um, the reason why this would be a top ten game for me, but it's hard to sort of get people to come over and play, and then have like Game Boy Advance and sort of hook that up. That was sort of the big problem with the connectivity feature is that it took a, too much to set up, and uh, it hurt otherwise good games like Zelda Four Swords Adventures, which unfortunately I won't be talking about in this video. Next up, we have Star Fox Adventures, which is unfortunately Rare's final console game on the Nintendo platform, and it's a, it's a really bad way to go. I'm not going to overstate this game's poor quality. It, it's not a horrible game. It's just a very mediocre game. Uh, it pretty much copied Zelda in every way. I know Rare did that a lot. You know, Banjo-Kazooie was like a Mario 64 clone. Diddy Kong Racing was a Mario Kart 64 clone. Even today, you know, Kinect Sports is a Wii Sports clone. They're still cloning Nintendo, even being with Microsoft. So that's not new, but the game just didn't feel that great. It, and it didn't feel like a Star Fox game, which of course it wasn't originally. They sort of shoehorned that in later. But um, the graphics are actually, are actually among the best on the GameCube. Uh, Rare used to be, you know, the technical masters. You know, a lot of the N64 games are still some of the best looking N64 games. I, that's just how rare it was. <laughs> the the key word is was. Uh, they're no longer that, unfortunately. Um, and unfortunately, introduced Crystal, which is like the sexualized like female character, like this fox character, which uh, a certain uh, furry community sort of rallies around. So that's an element I don't like. Though I don't want to overstate how like big that community is because it's not that big, but it's sort of like changes the way you think about this game a little bit, or at least it does for me. So, yeah, Star Fox Adventures. 
All right, next up we have Mario Kart Double Dash, and I got this on launch day, and it came with a bonus disc. Um, and uh, so Mario Kart 64 was sort of a, a universally loved game when that came, game came out, so everyone was anticipating this game, and uh, it actually ended up being a really divisive game. It basically had a double racing mechanic where you had you could control two characters. The person in the back, um, you know, controlled the items, and the person in the front drove. So you could play co-op with other people in the same cart. And it also had unique items for each character. And uh, different weights, you know, it, weights mattered more in this game than other games. Before it, I mean. Uh, I'm on the camp that didn't really like this game. I just, it didn't connect with me at all. I didn't like the courses. They were kind of like kitty. And I don't usually say that about Nintendo games because I feel like Nintendo games are for everyone. But this in particular was just too kitty for me and the music was like, it had a lot of whistling and it just didn't feel like they were speaking to me at that time. And like I said, the courses, they weren't very memorable. Uh, I just didn't like the two-cart mechanic either. I know a lot of professional players like this game because it's very, apparently very technical and, you know, difficult to master, but I just... Double Dash never connected with me. We'll just say that. Next up, we have Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. And this is one of the games where I feel like in a few years this might be in my top 10. I just haven't gotten around to playing it yet. And Fire Emblem has sort of skyrocketed in popularity lately because of Fire Emblem Awakening. And the series is basically known for like this permadeath feature where once your character dies in battle, it's basically like a strategy RPG. He's gone. He or she is gone for the rest of the game unless you reset the game. So that's a lot of consequence to actually playing. It's not like other games where if you die, you can just start over. So that's a really cool element, and uh, I definitely want to give this one a try. All right. So next up, we get Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. I need to remove the label still. This is one of those unique games that utilize the bongo drum uh, peripheral, which you can see on the front of the box here. Uh, this was actually made by Tokyo EAD, which is. Uh, one of Nintendo's divisions, um, they're known for the Mario Galaxy games and uh, Super Mario 3D World and Land. So uh, right now they're my favorite developer. This is a hell of a way to start too. Uh, it's a very fun game. You, it's it's odd because it's a platforming game where you control exclusively through the bongo drums. And it, while that sounds weird, it's really cool. And the boss battles feel really visceral because. You're sort of pounding on the drum while you're like beating the crap out of these enemies, so it, it just feels really great. My main knock against it is that it's a very short game. You can probably beat in like three hours. And I know some people are like, oh, it's a score-based game. Well, yeah, I've never really been a score guy when it comes to platformers, so so that's why I don't rate it higher. But it's definitely a great game and a must-play. All right, so next up we have Pokemon Coliseum. This is kind of a follow-up to Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2 on the N64. It has, like, that battle simulation thing where you can, you know, you can battle you know, Pokemon um, that you've brought from Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire and stuff like that. But it, it, other, aside from that, it also has a, um, a sort of story mode, which is sort of akin to the portable games where it's an actual adventure mode. Though, it, since it wasn't made by Game Freak, and it probably didn't have a great budget, it's very limited, like, it only has, it doesn't have that many Pokemon in it, and, uh, the story wasn't that great, but there is a novelty about playing a Pokemon adventure in 3D, so that's why I'd still recommend sort of playing this game, even today. Uh, there was also a sequel, Pokemon XD, but that never clicked with me, so that's why I'd recommend this one over that one. And finally, we have Beautiful Joe. Uh, another crappy uh, conditioned box, which I'll have to swap with another box sometime soon. So this was made by Hideki Kamiya, who is known for Bayonetta, um, The Wonderful 101 on the Wii U, um, Resident Evil 2, and Okami. So he's made a ton of great games, and this is another great game. It's sort of this 2D, very stylized um, side-scrolling game. Back when there weren't too many um, 2D games on the game or um, side scrollers on uh, console, because this was back when people thought 3D was the only way to go. And um, like I said, a very stylized uh, game with a lot of movie references. It's a very difficult game, which is why I don't rate it higher. I just haven't gotten that far into it because of how hard it is. So, so that's something. Uh, it was also on the PS2, but 
it wasn't as crisp, so that's why I still recommend the GameCube version over that one. So, uh, yeah, that is Beautiful Joe. And if you're wondering why I don't have Resident Evil 4 um, on this collection, it's because I unfortunately don't have it. I know that's crazy talk for a GameCube enthusiast to not have it, but I do have it on the Wii at least, which is basically the GameCube version, but a little bit improved. So I don't feel too bad about not owning it on the GameCube. But I just wanted to point that out as to why I don't have it. So, yeah, that's the GameCube. Uh, that's the end of this video. Um, uh, very underrated system, like I said in the beginning of the video. And um, I know at the time it didn't feel like it was that great of a system because there were a lot of droughts and um, it didn't sell well. So And people usually equate sales with quality. Like with the Wii U, it's not selling well, so people automatically think it's crap. But I'm telling you guys, it's going to be a great year for the Wii U. It has Bayonetta. To it has Super Smash Brothers, which looks incredible. Um, by the way, you know I can't stop watching that Mega Man reveal trailer. That's just uh, I love it, and it you know, it also has um, X, which is probably coming out this year, and it has Mario Kart, which actually looks really good. So it's gonna be a killer year for the Wii U. Sales aren't everything, and you know when you play the GameCube in 2014, you're not worried about how it's sold. You're not worried about the droughts that were there back in the day because none of that matters anymore. All that matters is that you know there are a ton of games that are out for it now, and you can just turn your system on and play them, and that's what's the most important. So, or what's important. So, yep, that is the Nintendo GameCube, and I hope you guys enjoy this video. I'm thinking of doing this a similar video for the PS2 and DS. So, you know, let me guys. Sorry, I can't speak. Let me know if you guys like this format, and um, yeah, we'll see if I can do more. All right, see you guys later.